starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning and afternoon, everyone. This is Brad Adams. For those of you guys who don't know me, I am the website chair for Tennessee HFMA, and it is my pleasure to host this month's Tennessee Trains on Tuesday webinar. Before we get started, uh, a couple of announcements. So some upcoming events. Um, we have got our webinar for next month. That will be on May 12th. Um, and the topic is going to have to do with 501R regulations and uncompensated care. And I expect registration is going to be going up for that within the week. Um, definitely by next Tuesday for sure we should have that up and ready to go. So you'll be able to go and sign out up for that. And we'll send out emails as usual. We have also got the Spring Institute coming up, um, and that's going to be once again at the Embassy Suites down in Franklin, Tennessee, in the Cool Springs area, and that's going to be May 18th through the 20th, um, and we are changing things around a little bit this year. It's going to be um, the golf tournament has been moved. Instead of having that on Monday morning, we are going to have that at when, on Wednesday afternoon, but we are still going to be at the Legends Club. Um, so so we, we've kept the good club, but we've moved to a better time. We think uh, that hopefully more people will be able to get out and golf. Um, so if you're interested in that, uh, you can go out to thespringinstitute.org, or there's a link on the main page of tnhfma.org. Um, and so we're going to have a lot of programs, and we are also going to have, um, for all the CPAs that are members, um, on Monday morning, a, a four-hour block with two hours with the required ethics course, and then two hours with an accounting and auditing update as well. Um, and so that's obviously available to all regular meeting attendees um, as well as we've got a special $75 um, price on that for just anyone in the CPA community who needs to come and get some education hours. And just one last reminder, um, we're coming up on the end of our chapter year, so you have probably already been getting uh, notifications from National uh, to renew your membership, so you can go ahead and do that. Memberships run out as always, at the end of May, and, and the new calendar cycle begins on June the 1st. A couple housekeeping items. Um, if you've got questions as we go through today's presentation, um, if you will just enter them in the questions box that you'll see there in your GoToWebinar um, controls, and we will get, get to all of those questions before the end. And also, if you need a continuing education certificate today, um, as our normal requirements, you need to be connected for at least uh, ninety percent of the duration or fifty minutes um, of the webinar and also respond to at least two-thirds of the polling questions we have got uh, three polling questions today so you'll need to respond to at least two of those three in order to qualify to receive your CPE certificate so it is my pleasure to introduce to all of you today um, Elizabeth Stass. I have known Elizabeth for about four years now. Uh, she is very active in both HFMA and AHIMA. She is the incoming president for the Virginia DC chapter of HFMA. Um, in addition to doing all of that work, she is the analysis revenue cycle consultant at Recondo Technology. And uh, she has got a wealth of revenue cycle and healthcare knowledge, has been involved in several different uh, organizations throughout throughout her time in healthcare, and I'm going to hand it over to Elizabeth and let her tell you more. Okay, thank you so very much, Brad. I greatly appreciate the introduction and the opportunity to talk to your audience. Um, we have just an hour, so I'm going to go ahead and get scooting if that suits everyone. Today we're going to talk about engaging touch-free practices within your revenue cycle and a lot of different options that are available in the industry that can assist you. Let me go ahead and move this forward. So um, we've got kind of got an overview and what we're going to talk about is how to transform your revenue cycle from account administration, read that as manual labor, um, to a much more patient service operation. So we're going to concentrate on focusing on patient service um, leading to increased patient satisfaction, so how you can transition some of your FTE from a lot of manual online or telephone calls to payers so that they can refocus and actually concentrate on facing their patients and increasing that patient satisfaction. We're going to talk about some industry statistics to kind of give you a global view. Some of this may not be new information. Um, and then we'll talk about uh, some different revenue cycle process challenges, 
some technology solutions that are available across the industry, and some best practices for each activity. So it'll cover eligibility, authorizations, collections, payer follow-up, kind of the gamut of some of the manual tasks that your staff might currently be engaged in. So uh, this might not be new to you, but you can imagine who that red line at the very top of this is. Um, as a nation, um, the U.S. far outpaces other industrialized nations on the cost of health care as part of our GDP. And today we're looking at nearly 18% of our economy is a health care expense, or if you put it another way, nearly one out of every five dollars is spent on health care. And when you look over the past 30 years, you can see that the United States is continuously increasing, and we need to come up with some resolution to decrease those costs. So talking about the different challenges within the healthcare revenue cycle, inside the hospital system, we're obviously all expected to do a lot more with a lot less. The volumes are increasing, the complexities, the new requirements make these economics even more difficult. And some of the areas like eligibility, that's become more challenging with the Affordable Care Act and people are switching their coverage more frequently and trying to track that information down is not exactly an easy route. Authorizations, which have been very um, manually um, afforded, they're going to increase um, as far as the volume of authorizations needed and the complexity of them. Upfront collections is also necessary because the patient bad debt is increasing, also uh, patient deductibles are increasing. And ultimately, all of our costs to administer this um, health care continuum continues to increase by at least 10% per year. So today's bad habit is for patient access to try and complete as many activities as they possibly can for that um, preceding that data service. And if they can't, they just hope and pray that the business office can resolve them on the back end. So this just leads, obviously, to higher administrative costs and rework. Um, let's talk about some denials. And in understanding your uh, key performance, performance metrics, <clears throat> initial denial reason volumes vary by provider and services, obviously. Typically, the largest denials occur with an eligibility and authorization. And many times, the eligibility and demographics can be fixed and rebuilt relatively easily but authorizations require additional work and also those fund appeals that we all have to go through. So if the revenue cycle leadership and patient access and the business office can collaborate, they can be actively monitoring these metrics and identifying opportunities to minimize those denials, kind of learning from our mistakes. But even after you work the denial, the remaining write-offs can still be very significant. Um, the denials can be reduced um, for those write-offs, but the volume of labor to handle that is becoming more and more excessive. Here's just an example um, that was recently done by Milliman um, regarding the manual versus electronic cost per transaction. And you can see the dramatic gap between what the manual cost is and the electronic. Uh, let's just look at prior authorization because that's obviously uh, sticking out like a sore thumb. When you imagine that you have staff that typically use their talent and their tenure to identify, or maybe even the physician's office, whether the patient and their particular benefits and the procedure they're being scheduled for does or does not need an authorization. And then you add in that they have to reach out to the payer to obtain the authorization, verify if the authorization is accurate, and make sure that it matches the procedure, the date range, the location. That is a huge manual cost. If you can identify uh, one of the different opportunities that's available in the industry to automate that process, you have a huge, huge savings. And you also typically get very, very uh, a lower amount of denial. So looking at these different types of capabilities, 
Um, by enabling a transformational change within your revenue cycle, you can ensure that the proper steps are completed upfront in patient access, meaning at the point of scheduling or shortly thereafter. You can enable robust patient access, access activities, so eligibility, registration QA, authorizations, upfront patient collections, financial assistance. All of those can be automated uh, by a variety of different um, resources in the industry. You can automate processing so that you allow the data to process without human intervention. Think of all the hours and the times of your staff trying to reach out to a payer, perhaps either by phone or going to their website, manually keying information to identify the specific charge they might be inquiring on. It's a huge waste of energy and talent, um, and it can be compressed by utilizing automation. So now we'll kind of dig into a couple of those different areas. So, there's several different areas that uh, a variety of uh, opportunity is available. Um, let's talk about these seven different areas. One of them is eligibility alerting. And this is the ability to identify and resolve any additional data necessary to, in, to achieve eligibility and therefore reduce the denials and rework. And many systems can return eligibility saying it's yes or no, the patient does or doesn't have coverage. But when you're looking for specific benefit information, if you're looking for Medicare eligi um, eligible returns, but it can be delegated to a Medicare HMO or um, a supplemental program to Medicaid, then you're taking additional manual steps by automating it you can alleviate those manual steps and ensure a significantly higher percentage of accuracy, especially when you go utilize a resource that can go straight to a payer website. Um, there's comprehensive payer data retrieval. So some payers have placed their data sources, like more detailed benefit data or authorization status, submit capabilities on their website, but you can't obtain that through typical EDI um, um, documentation that you receive. Because the EDI is just not robust enough to handle our much more comprehensive programs now. Another area is the authorization status retrieval. So typically authorizations are very manual and you still get denials or appeals. Of course, unfortunately, um, nobody can ever help when a radiologist might change a procedure at the last minute, but there's other ways to look at it. Um, the capability to automatically return a payer authorization status um, and authorization numbers and the substantiation of that authorization is available out in the industry by a variety of vendors and solutions. Looking at patient responsibility collection, because patient bad debt's rising, because um, uh, the different types of programs that the patients are um, engaged in right now is rising. The capability to automatically determine truly what a patient will owe before the procedure and being able to engage them in an active discussion on how to resolve that debt ahead of time is um, much more beneficial to your organization. There's automated transaction processing. So all these capabilities sound great, but your staff doesn't have time to process each of these. If you use automated transaction processing, or ATP, it can let the system process the accounts to completion without having end user intervention. Utilizing exception-based work lists so that your staff only concentrates on the true exceptions and the other patient accounts can flow through the process without them getting involved can uh, alleviate a lot of wasted effort. And all of these different solutions across the industry typically provide a lot of detailed data reporting to allow you to utilize a learning loop. So you learn from the errors that are uh, causing the denial so that you can make changes within your process and not have those denials occur in the future. So kind of a, a big overview, obviously eligibility verification 
in the typical method is just not enough. Um, I pointed this out earlier, but I wanted to highlight again that eligibility accounts for uh, eligibility accounts for approximately a quarter of the denials in patient access and registration. Um, technical errors occur in about one-third of them. So the reality is that existing eligibility verification processes and the data they return are quite inadequate. Engaging with a resource, and there's many available in the industry, that can automate this process with direct payer connection as opposed to EDI is going to dramatically reduce those errors. It's no longer adequate to just simply verify eligibility. You need the accurate benefit data that your staff can leverage and minimize these denials. So if the eligibility capabilities that can reduce the denials and enable efficiencies are engaged, you can utilize those direct payer connections so if there's managed care on file, be it Medicare or Medicaid, you can determine whether it's Part A or Part B only. If there's a secondary or a tertiary payer, um, you can utilize self-pay validation um, with many of the resources that are available. So imagine if your patient presents and, and either doesn't know what their coverage is or refuses to tell you, you have a lot of different resources available in the industry to check some of the top payers in your area and see what type of coverage they may have. So when you're thinking about best practices, um, one of the most critical things you can do is start to analyze the reasons you currently have for eligibility rejections and denial. Um, concentrating on that and working with your business office to understand those root causes is going to float to the surface a lot of where your problems may be. You also might want to consider collaborating with your physician offices to improve the completeness and accuracy of scheduling data. That'll help them better understand the value and the worth of this. Um, you can define and communicate with your team individual goals. You can measure performance with a lot of these different reporting capabilities and getting ahead of the schedule, getting way ahead pre-working ahead of your data service is ideally um, very important. If you can do that seven days or more prior to the data service, you're going to be well ahead of the game. And additionally, one thing to keep in, uh, in consideration is to leverage the data across uh, the different departments within your organization. Um, I found that in many cases they don't share that type of data and it creates a lot of rework. So developing something internal uh, within your organization to ensure that you share this data across each different department is going to assist your organization as a whole in the long run. Moving on to authorizations. Obviously they're very challenging. They're becoming a lot more frequent and a lot more complex with the different types of um, benefits that are offered out there. Um, a recent advisory board study showed that the number of procedures requiring authorizations increased by 23% back in 2012. A lack of an authorization can have significant financial impact on the provider. Um, to address, many hospitals have attempted to um, minimize this risk by employing large teams to manage the whole authorization process. Uh, and this includes medical necessity and ADNs, inpatient notification. There are lots of different solutions available within the industry that can automate this process so nothing slips through the cracks and you're not overstaffing on weekends or trying to play catch up. Now authorizations do have one of the highest costs when you obtain them manually. Um, as, as I showed you earlier, it is significant. Um, it's a dramatic um, uh, expense to your organization. So many current authorizations tools do have limited automation. So when you are looking at different types of solutions, um, understand what capabilities are out there. So the 278 is truly only used by about two payers that I'm aware of today. But many payer authorization capabilities allow you to go to their web portal and um, indicate inpatient notification, or they allow a fax capability. 
those can be automated by a lot of different solutions that are available. So ask some additional questions when you're talking to those um, providers and see what they can do to assist you. You can automate medical necessity. Um, you, and in order to effectively manage all the authorizations, healthcare providers today need a solution that does a lot more than tell you an authorization is required or tracks the manual capture of it. You need to be able to intelligently, electronically determine if the authorization is valid and how many authorizations are needed for a particular patient's date of service and be able to track those and identify when they're missing. And in fact, uh, the capability to um, auto-connect to the ordering physician's office to alert them when an authorization is missing or inaccurate, that's a capability you should seek as well. So they can obviously uh, reduce denial and improve your staff efficiency. If you can think back to how many staff members and how far in advance you start uh, seeking authorizations, determining if they're needed, um, you typically have a very large staff uh, handling this process, and in many cases, they're spinning their wheels. Um, you can automate this process so it occurs at the point of scheduling, during pre-registration, or even at registration. Um, there are capabilities available in the industry today that you can quickly identify when a procedure has been changed from what was originally scheduled. Uh, perhaps it was an MRI um, without contrast, and now they do need contrast. It's a lot easier to get that authorization 24 to 48 hours post the procedure than it is several weeks down the road when you actually get the denial. So getting a leap upon that will definitely help your organization. Um, and authorization capabilities are critical across all primary functions, from its submission, notification, status, and medical necessity. For submission, this includes both notifications and hospital-initiated services, such as direct or ER admit. And payers that are supported for notifications right now, um, to my knowledge, are United Healthcare and Aetna. But we do expect in the industry a lot more payers are going to require that. So being able to create some automation there is going to definitely assist you. Um, when you're checking authorization status, you have to keep in mind that many payers use auth agents, um, AIM, NIA, MedSolutions, CareCore. So being able to identify a solution that can go out to those as well based on the specific payer and the benefit package is going to be very helpful. And you do want to find something that will alert your staff when there is an exception. So in cases when there's no exception, they uh, automatically determine that an authorization is needed, that the authorization um, can be submitted for, that the authorization is on file, verifying the validity of the authorization. Does it match the date range? Does it match the um, procedure? Does it match the location? Having an automated solution sitting in that spot is going to save your staff a significant volume of time and allow them to concentrate on the much more difficult ones. When we're talking about medical necessity, excuse me, medical necessity, you do want to be able to utilize the rules um, and maintain the latest NCD and LCD rules out there. And that's on commercial payer variations, and that will minimize your denial. And finally, ensuring that um, when you engage one of the entities that provides this, that they provide integration back into your HIF environment that allows the authorization to go so far as to being placed on the claim to be submitted back to your payers. Um, keep in mind that not all HIF environments truly have the capability to catch, if you will, all that detail, but there are ways to come up with workarounds for them and make it work best within your shop. So kind of wrapping this up a bit under authorizations and some best practices, one of the most critical things that you and your organization can do 
is to clearly define and communicate your authorization's policy, be that internally and externally to some of the referring physicians, because they can be complex, and clear policies and responsibilities will help improve that process. And it's really good to ask for input from all the departments that play a part in your authorization process. Collaborating with your physicians is another best practice. The reality is that physicians don't like to off-process either. I'm not sure that anybody actually does. But if you can work together with them and determine how best to improve the existing process and making sure you're compliant with the STAR clause, of course. So let's move on to upfront patient responsibility. Hey, Elizabeth, um, do you want to go ahead and do a polling question before we move on to the next topic? Go right ahead. All right. So our first polling question asks, what type of detail can be extracted from a payer website? So remember, if you need a CPE certificate, you need to respond to two of the three polling questions. Um, if you don't know the answer, feel free to pick one. You don't have to be correct to get your certificate. You just have to respond so that we know you are still there. So Elizabeth, as you've been, you know, working with different clients and, and doing some of this stuff, I'll ask kind of the question from my point of view, which is I'm part of the diagnostic labs where I'm at, and you know, authorizations is kind of a, a newer topic to us, it, but something we've been talking more and more about lately, especially um, on some of the more uh, genetic and, and newer type of testing. Is that anything you've been been seeing or hearing from, from clients or at conferences? Um, actually, I, I've had a lot of discussion about this, and as the, the more difficult the procedure and the more nuances that it has, Brad, does require a, a more manual intervention, but if some of the more status quo authorizations, so maybe 60 plus percent of the off that are um, typical within your organization can be automated, it allows a, a higher concentration on the more difficult ones. I do know that those that require um, specific procedures, it might be a gamma knife or it's a, um, there's a high, high um, cost prescription involved, those typically are still a manual process. Does that answer your question? It does. And so we have, we've we've got the results in here, and, and you should be able to see them on the screen. 58% uh, of folks uh, mentioned uh, patient eligibility and benefits. Very good. All right. So, all right. Should be back to you now. Okay, great. So talking about upfront patient responsibility, obviously we've got a lot higher deductibles out there, especially with um, the new um, Affordable Care Act and some of those programs. So just like pharmacy and dental, collecting patient responsibility up front for medical services has become much more mainstream. Uh, a lot of organizations have really refined this, while others are still just getting the typical deductible, or excuse me, the typical copay. But upfront collections has a significant impact on increasing the net revenue, reducing the bad debt, and reducing all that overall administrative cost of health care. So the need to collect upfront is going to continue to increase as the patient's portion continues to increase with those high deductible health plans and health savings accounts. So trying to accurately identify what the patient truly owes upfront and do that at uh, the time of patient registration is going to be much more helpful to your organization. So to kind of lay the field out there, if you look at the HSAs and the high deductible health plans that are continuing to grow at a rapid rate, many of the affordable care plans are expected to experience increased patient financial responsibility through the benefit plan. And being able to identify exactly where the patient sits is key. That can be obtained by accessing the payer website in many, if not most, cases. That type of information typically is either unavailable or inaccurate when you get it through 
uh, standard EDI response. So um, looking in 2013 and the hospital revenue mix, it indicated that the patient revenue can account for 30% of the total hospital revenue, especially at the beginning of the benefit year when all the deductibles have reset. So within patient responsibility, the deductible represents the largest benefit to collect. Usually that's 50% of the patient responsibility. Coinsurance represents about 35%, and copay represents about 15%. So the bottom line of, of, of looking at those types of statistics is that collecting only deductibles or copayments isn't sufficient enough anymore. And so why are we focusing on point of service collections? Well, the cost to collect from the patient 30, 60 days or more past service costs a lot of money with statements and phone calls. And when you think about time value money, if a patient owes $2,000, it's not worth $2,000 when you don't get that money from the patient 60, 90 days down the road. And the cost doesn't yield very good results. The recent studies um, measure that the patient collection rate drops from 50 to 60 percent. So if you're only collecting half the amount due from the patient and financials aren't being managed very well. For a medium-sized hospital, the bad debt can exceed over a million dollars in radiology alone. So a solid upfront collection process improves patient satisfaction. Well, in order to do that, you need to be able to tell the patient what they owe. So all patient estimation tools are created equally. Excuse me, not all patient estimation tools are created equally. There's a lot of HIS environments that have them embedded, but they're not extracting exactly what the patient owes on a run rate of um, historical remits and contracts to see a more detailed level exactly what they owe. So if you add automation, you can have the ability to automatically determine the patient financial responsibility without end user intervention. So your staff isn't flipping through post-it notes, looking up charge masters. They're not trying to do that manual calculation. There are many solutions available that can automate that process for you. So the automated processing completes the whole eligibility verification it does procedure selection. It assists with the application of the appropriate benefits and can automatically calculate the patient responsibility. Many different solutions available that provide this. And then we think about accuracy. <clears throat> you want to find something that can have the ability to match the patient estimate back to when the payer remit finally arrives just to ensure that there's no gap in that. And if there is, make some adjustments. because. Contracts change, um, pricing does change, benefits do change, but as long as you have a very, very slim gap of error, it should provide you a very accurate rule and make your organization very important um, in that capacity to provide patient estimation and then collect what is due. You obviously want to look at integration with different functions within your organization. Um, payment processing, there's payment plans, there's financial counseling. All of um, these types of things can be engaged with automation. So kind of looking at best practices with upfront collections. Um, you want to seek something that's going to provide you a very successful program, and that can include ensuring you've got stakeholder input and participation. That means your senior leadership, and it also includes different areas such as pre-visit, patient access, your staff positions, your clinicians, your business office. IT is going to have to get involved in senior leadership. But engaging the senior leadership and kicking this off and those ongoing checkpoints is going to raise awareness and obtain the buy-in you're going to need across your organization to make this successful. Um, if your organization might be new to upfront collections, you might want to consider piloting maybe in <clears throat> outpatient radiology or, or um, your ED prior to moving into surgery. So you can kind of test in different phases. 
I have seen that type of model roll out, and it typically has a better buy-in because you start getting a rolling tide with different uh, segments of your organization. You obviously have to be aware of EMTALA, so you do need to screen and stabilize your patients prior to obtaining insurance and financial information, but those are relatively easy steps to set up. Um, I will tell you HFMA does have some best practices available uh, if you need to have further consultation on that. You do need to clearly communicate your goals, train your staff, um, manage and publish those goals and progress. I'm aware of a lot of different organizations that have um, different types of team goals and they also reward their staff when their team hits those goals or exceeds them and it's worked very profitably for their organization. You might also want to look at external communications that can help your doctors and patients understand the program and the purpose and also understand the outcome of it. Um, ideally, you'd like to work uh, in advance of your data service by at least seven days. So another area that you can incorporate into um, this particular aspect with whichever um, solution you determine is financial counseling. Um, with these high deductibles, patients can't afford them. We're hearing it over the news, we're hearing it from HFMA, we're hearing it from AHAM. They have four and five thousand dollar family um, family-wide deductibles and they can't afford to pay them. They may have signed up for uh, the state Medicaid program or the supplement, but they didn't know any better and they can't afford it. So your financial counselors have a very important role within your organization and directly with the patient. They can help the patient receive the care that they need while still ensuring that the payment method are understood and providing them a variety of options. Those financial counselors help protect your hospital's cash flow and expose you to unnecessary bad debt and ongoing collection expense. So there's many different tools that are available that can be incorporated into this automated process and that can be credit scoring, it could be propensity to pay where it doesn't affect the patient's credit score, um, the likelihood the patient would qualify for charity or for a state, local, or federal program, payment plan, um, and, and different types of applications can help your financial counselors navigate very swiftly different options for those patients that are seemingly looking down the road at something they just can't touch. Um, looking at different types of automation, I mentioned earlier that, that having some exception-based work lists available to your staff so that they can concentrate on only specific areas or exceptions and allow all the other accounts to flow um, through the process will empower your staff and they can both, excuse me, focus on patient care. And through different types of automation, you can spend less on administrative time and manual tasks and only concentrate on those exceptions. So let's move on to um, business office claims and follow-up practices. <clears throat> this is a fun one that's been coming about uh, in the past few years in the industry and can only be done with automation that has a direct connection to the payer. So there's many operational practices currently in play that are being followed that have adversely impacted the financial performance of healthcare organizations. So most hospitals follow one or more of these practices, which is not optimal. If they're typically waiting to check a claim status for 30, 60, 90 plus days. Some cases it might be a little bit earlier. It might be 21 days. But all it does is increase your days in AR. It makes your bad debt go up. And it makes your denials increase because as we all know, the longer you wait to reverse a denial, the less options you have to be successful. In many cases, organizations staff up to check pay your site manually because as we all know, the electronic response you get or your remit that you receive might tell you that a claim is denied or pended, but it really won't tell you what you're supposed to do with it. So your staff is reaching out to that payer to find out exactly what's going on. 
great, great increase of their labor costs. <clears throat> because of that, many organizations don't have the ability to follow up on all claims. So it could be that they get a uh, response on their event saying that the claim's been approved, but there are line item denials that they can never get to. So they might be outsourcing them to a third party, or they just truly can't get to them and they become a write-off. So checking the claim status on an EDI, that 276-277 response, is a much higher cost for FTE, and you don't obtain actionable data. There are solutions in the industry that can provide this to you by direct connection to those payer websites. So um, here's an example um, of, a, let's see, we've got an EDI response on here on United Healthcare, and you get a finalized claim status that the claim's been denied, but you can't do anything with it until you actually access through a web bot or whatever you wish to call it, an electronic capability to access that particular payer's website. And typically, this is available 24 to 48 hours from the time you submit a claim. So imagine if you can obtain the detail and actionable status, 24, 48 hours, sometimes 36, based on the payer, from the date you submit the claim, as opposed to waiting 21, 30, 60 plus days down the road, and you're receiving this detail electronically so that you can take an actionable step on this particular um, type of account. It gives you that capability. Um, in this particular example, as it shows, it just says it was denied, but the EDI, um, excuse me, on the EDI, but the true reason is an itemized bill. So you need to submit an itemized bill. You can submit that electronically, direct it to a staff member, and in many cases, and I've actually seen this, you can receive a payment on the same remit that you're getting the initial denial on because you leapfrogged that process by utilizing automation. And we should expect the same type of opportunity with ICD-10. So transforming this whole claims workflow can give you an upwards to 90% no touch rate. <clears throat> so imagine payer status at adjudication this is the ability to return claim status early and process. So you're not waiting those um, delays in remit and posting an assignment that can take many days and a lot of manual intervention. Patients can get billed sooner, so you can get paid sooner. You get actionable claim status, and this is the ability to return actionable claim status data from the payer site and normalize it into what internal um, common actions or statuses that your organization may use. You can eliminate actually looking at paid claims or claims that are going to be paid. Your staff doesn't even have to touch those through this type of automation. You can automate the exception. So if um, it gives you the ability to auto-respond to payer denials um, for the most common denied reasons, let's say it's missing an authorization number or an itemized bill or a medical record, um, you can automate those processes to send those out without having human intervention. You can also look at staff and management performance and imagine the productivity goals you can establish and manage your staff throughout the day, week, or month and reallocate your staff when you've got particular errors. Your staff will appreciate knowing their productivity and quality, and there's, then there's no surprises on their performance review. And again, as I mentioned earlier, you have a learning loop. You can take this detailed data from the, the uh, resource you engage to provide you this automation and allow your team to analyze it and avoid those repeat or common denials. One very interesting aspect that you can utilize is when you take it to your contract management department and have payer collaboration. If you're consistently getting denials from a particular payer because they always want um, uh, medical records or they always want an ED discharge um, document, you can go back to your payers and have those collaborative discussions 
to see if you can alleviate that process or automatically submit them with the claim. Any questions at this point, or Brad, did you want to jump in? Uh, let's go ahead, if you don't mind, let's go ahead and do another polling question. So our next polling question is, what types of data are typically missing from EDI responses? And so your options here are patient deductibles met to date, actionable claim status, patients having secondary coverage, uh, authorization, substination, and line item denials. And I think you threw that substantiation in there just to throw me off. Substantiation. Substantiation. See, I still can't even get it right. I thought I did. <sighs> if it was Wednesday, we could just blame, you know, Garfield cartoons, but it's not. Wait, that's Mondays. Never mind. Dilbert's Wednesdays. Uh, yeah. So, anyways, so it looks like uh, we've got quite a variety um, of, of responses coming in here. Um, kind of the top two at about 30% each are actionable claim status and patients having secondary benefit coverage. Very good. So I'm going to leave this up for about five more seconds uh, to give people a chance to respond. Remember, you've got to respond if you want CPE. All right. And just so everyone can see, there are the responses. And we've got one more polling question we will do sometime between now and the end of the presentation. Okay, and I see we only have a, about 15 minutes left, and I wanted to leave um, open time for questions. So I am going to start to wrap up. Um, talking a little bit more about the automation of the claims workflow and being able to obtain the detailed payer status. Uh, this is truly a, a cutting-edge technology that there are several options within the industry to provide this. Uh, there is no way to obtain this unless they have a direct payer connection, and it can occur, as I said, typically within 24, 48 hours from the time the claim is submitted. Every payer adjudicates in a relatively standard rate, and this can be utilized not only for professional claims, physician claims, but also on the acute care side. So if you're looking to reduce your overhead for your FTEs that are doing claims follow-up to minimize those write-offs, and um, you want to truly transform your follow-up process, you can help alleviate this by uh, identifying some of the different um, entities within the industry that can provide you that automated claim status. And imagine, as I said before, they can obtain the detailed status. It can be crosswalked essentially to your next step so that it can automate your follow-up process. Your staff can avoid looking at specific um, remit because they're not going to assist them in any way, shape, or form. They can get a jump start on reversing denied claims, um, refocusing those pended claims by submitting whatever type of um, data or information the payer is seeking, and avoid touching any claims that are going to be paid or paid in full. It also gives the capability to look at those line item denial and allocate them internally to ensure that you're getting prompt and proper payment from your payers. I will tell you that uh, the detailed follow-up reporting on this has uh, proven within the industry to be very beneficial when having those follow-up conversations with your specific payers, not necessarily um, awaiting for uh, contract time, but to have those ongoing discussions. Um, imagine how much it alleviates the payer's overhead when you're not reaching out to them via telephone as well. Uh, it causes them staff uh, allocation in addition to that. The learning loop, um, I'm just jumping back a step here, the learning loop is very beneficial as well to your organization so that as you're 
um, looking at coding claims and your claim submission process, you can um, alleviate some of those repeated denials or repeated errors that you've been having just by being able to better analyze what the detailed um, deny or pended reason is. It's going to give you a great capability in that aspect. Um, and obviously, by following these types of steps, your staff, your internal staff, can perform more optimally and achieve um, increased patient satisfaction and increased patient care by concentrating more on the face-to-face -face activities with the patient and less of the manual steps reaching out to the payer just to figure out what in the world you're supposed to do with the claim now. Um, as we all know, um, many of the payers and the whole claim processing um, um, evolution, if you will, is getting exceedingly more difficult with a lot more rules and a lot more hoops to jump through. So being able to put some guidance and some binders on there to allow your staff to better direct the workflow and your managers to be able to oversee it and manage it is going to help your organization in many ways. So that pretty much is the end of the different areas I was going to engage with uh, you today. If there are any questions, um, Brad, if anybody's populated any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Uh, we don't yet, but so if you've got a question for Elizabeth, please go ahead and enter that in the question box. And while you do that, we are going to go ahead and launch our last polling question. Uh, which is, how can your organization reduce your denial volume? Uh, and so your options here are accurate benefit levels for specific procedures, detailed reporting of initial denials, authorizations validated prior to the scheduled date of service, and verification of benefits and coverage pre-service, or none of the above. So Elizabeth, I just on behalf of Tennessee HFMA, thank you for uh, putting on this webinar. This has been great. I know a lot of the things that you talk about here are things that we're constantly, you know, talking about and working on at Vanderbilt. Um, so this is is very timely and informative, especially um, as we're trying to kind of navigate and figure out how we want to do some of these things, particularly like I mentioned before, um, with with identifying what we need for authorizations. Very good. Yeah, there's lots of different solutions that are available out there uh, that can assist all these different uh, healthcare providing organizations uh, engage some automation and reduce those manual steps. So um, we do have a couple of questions that have come in now, so I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. Um, so the first one is um, they're not quite clear what is meant um, when you mentioned a bot earlier, I think, going out. Uh, you know, having a bot get the information off the web pages. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Sure. Um, typically, and there's a lot of different terminologies that's utilized in the industry, it's, it's essentially a web bot that um, relatively emulates the keystrokes that your staff members would utilize to go out to the payer website and obtain specific types of information. Um, and Typically, they are designed with intelligent thought process engaged. Uh, they can answer pretty static questions. So let's say if it's an authorization submission, um, they can respond to those questions the payer would typically ask in that manual process so that it leapfrogs and obtains the detailed information in many ways that WebBot um, is performing a calculation as it brings the data back and normalizes it for your particular organization and your next step needs. I hope that makes sense. That, that does to me, but I'm a tech person, so, um, <laughs> you know, it, it, if, if whoever asks this, if it doesn't, um, I think probably please feel free to reach out to Elizabeth or, uh, or feel free to reach out to me and I can kind of help. Um, explain that um, in a little bit more depth. Um, we had one question about if the PowerPoints will be available. Uh, the PowerPoints are available. I'd put the link in the chat earlier, but if you just go to uh, tnhfma.org and under education, click on the webinars, you'll see a list of all of our 
current and past webinars there and you can get to the slides um, and video recordings uh, for many of those and we'll be getting the recording of, of today's webinar posted within the next day or so as well. Um, and we have a, another question and, and they're wanting to know where they can find a listing of some of these different automated solutions. Um, I'd be happy to provide offline a different a list of all the different organizations that I'm aware of that provides them. Um, another place to look is also uh, those that are on national HFMA or maybe supporting your local HFMA chapters. Um, I'm aware of about five, five or six different groups off the top of my head that do provide this type of technology in varying capabilities. Excellent. Yeah, so I think definitely the, the peer review out on national HFMA um, and then obviously, you know, Tennessee HFMA, we've got all of our sponsors listed on our website and you can get uh, links to their websites and contact information um, for representatives from all of those as well. Um, or just reach out to Elizabeth. She knows this stuff real well and she can kind of help steer you in the right direction. And that's, that's it for, uh, that was the last question that we had come in. So Elizabeth, thank you once again for um, providing us with this great information. And to everyone else, uh, you will be getting an email in about an hour or so with a link uh, for a survey. If you can click on that, it only takes about two minutes to complete the surveys for the webinars. Um, and otherwise, hopefully we will see you on here next month. Thanks again, Elizabeth. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. All right, goodbye and have a great day, everybody.